Now back to our interview with Howard Kelly, one of Jacksonville's pioneer broadcasters. Oh, a great deal uh, more live television. Uh, of course, public service was a part of that as well as, uh, as news. You didn't have as much news as you have today, but you had a lot more public service programming. Uh, the morning talk shows, cooking shows, those kinds of things, uh, bringing in interviews from the Red Cross and all the kinds of public service things that we were doing, as well as children's programming, live children's programming, particularly in the afternoon. Something that just does not exist anymore. Doesn't exist anymore, no. A part of growing up was going to the TV station and being uh, on those shows. Yes, it was, and, and, and I, I have to tell this story. Um, when I was growing up as a small child, uh, my neighbor uh, lived four, do four doors down the street. It was a teenager by the name of Ed McCullers. And Ed was my babysitter when my mother wanted to go out and my mother and father went out and uh, Ed would come down and babysit. Ed, of course, became Skipper Ed on Channel 12 for many years. Um, and it was rather an interesting relationship that he and I had because eventually when I became uh, a general manager, of Channel 12, he was my employee, <laughs> uh, but we were great, great friends, and I had a great deal of respect for him. But it and just you would have gone to be on Skipper Ed. I was uh, never on Skipper Ed, interestingly oh, really? enough. But years later, uh, well, not years later, but about that same time when uh, Channel 4 was on the air with Virginia Adder and uh, their afternoon uh, show, uh, I came down as a Cub Scout here at Channel 4 and had her sing a love song to me and all the other Cub Scouts giggled away as um, somebody snuck up behind me uh, and rolled up my pants legs while she was singing this, <laughs> this song to me. And then later on, many years later, um, I hired Virginia to come to Channel 12. She worked at Channel 12 for about three years with Ed McCullers. So we've, uh, we've been kind of an interesting family of broadcasters. Yeah, yeah very interesting. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about those early days. You yes. were a reporter yes. at uh, Channel 12. And uh, although you had this broadcasting degree and so forth, uh, reporting was still something, I mean, television, local news was still in its infancy, shall we say. Uh, yes. And, you know, developing and becoming more respectable in terms of uh, credible journalism. Uh, it, it was no long, it was in making a transition from the days when they would just be reading wire copy and so That's forth. right. The, the, the well, there was local coverage, yeah. and um, what was interesting from a broadcaster's point of view, that to work in a news department back then, you had to be a jack of all trades. You had to be a reporter, you had to be a writer, you had to be a photographer, and in some cases, if you were a junior person and uh, were sentenced to working nights or weekends, you wound up having to even process your own film as well as editing your film and putting it on the air. So you really had to be a jack of all trades. And of course, as the technology evolved, those technologies became so much co so more uh, complex that uh, you began to see the specialization of anchors who only anchored and reporters who only reported and photographers that only took pictures. Um, but in those days, you uh, had to be uh, very flexible um, in what you were able to cover. Um, women did not cover violent stories. Uh, they weren't set out on murders and, and generally not even on fires. Uh, we all had to have some sense of what was going on politically and socially in our communities to understand the relevance of the stories that we were reporting. Well, I think uh, in in 1964 and for a few years thereafter, uh, there weren't that many women no. or African Americans in your typical newsroom. That's right. Um, you had some real pioneers in both uh, Channel 4 and Channel 12 really brought in some real pioneers. At Channel 12 it was Mac Freeman mm -hmm. and it was at a time um, that um, this city was in great, great racial turmoil. The 60s, of course, being one of the most um, if not one, not the most violent period of our history, certainly socially and politically, one of the most tumultuous decades that we've ever gone through. We had uh, everything from discredited high schools to the racial issues that ran through the entire decade from the riots of downtown to school busing issues. In the middle of that, you had Hurricane Dora, and eventually the, the decade closed out with consolidation. That's a little bit unusual, isn't it? 
to go from reporter to general manager? It's unusual to go from the news department to general management, yes, and there are very few of us that have ever done that, uh, but it's... It, Usually it, it would be from sales. Sales. Yeah. Usually the sales manager will follow that track because after all, the television station is not unlike a newspaper. It's in the business of making money. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I know when I made the transition, um, and I had that long talk with my boss about moving from the news department into uh, general management. He said, look, uh, you know how to spend money better than anybody I know, but I'm not sure you know how to make money. And he was right. I mean, I had to learn uh, how to make money with television. I had a whole new language out there I had to learn and how to sell and, and, and to manage people that sold. Well, those of us who were in the news business are uh pleased that uh, there are some examples like you who, uh, <laughs> Thank you. who did that. And, uh, I, and I guess it was, uh, it, you did have to kind of uh, refocus, didn't you? Uh, yeah, you really did. And, and um, uh, I mean, I'd, every afternoon I'd drift down to the news department, you know, before they went on the air because my heart was still beating down there, but I had a whole television station to run. I had a bottom line to produce and I had to find the balance between the two. But it's been a while since you were general manager at Channel 12. Yes. Because uh, we'll get to it in a moment. Okay. You had a whole other career after yes. you left Channel 12. So you left Channel 12 in about what year? 1985. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, needless to say, since 1985, there have been a lot of changes in the television. Certainly have been, and, and most of those have been technologically based. And uh, when I mentioned earlier that um, a reporter had to be a jack of all trades, um, shooting film and editing film and what have you, of course, we don't do film anymore and we do videotape. But what was interesting is the way we had to cope with what we had in terms of tools. I can remember very clearly that uh, we would have photographers uh, covering uh, a Florida football game in Gainesville and at halftime the uh, junior photographer that was filming the game would grab up all the film that had been taken of the first half put it in an orange envelope and run to the Gainesville bus station Greyhound bus station and put it on a bus headed for Jacksonville and somebody from the station running down to the uh, down to uh, the Greyhound bus station here getting that film getting it to the station getting it processed and getting it on the air by 6:20 Mm -hmm. um, there were no satellite uh, feeds to be had then, and it was film that had to be processed and edited and had to be written to. Um, a very, very different world back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, we used to pay uh, flight attendants or stewardesses then uh, on airlines to um, run out to the airport and slip a stewardess, you know, 10 bucks and give her an envelope with film so that we could get it up to a sister station or another station that requested in, in Atlanta or Charleston. That's the way we transported our news film. Um, but today, of course, we can call up and order up a satellite feed. Uh, or if it's close enough, we can do it by our own microwave signals out of the back of the pickup truck um, to get that story told. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have happened uh, in, in this whole scheme is this ability to move the news from the studio out to the site. It doesn't necessarily always produce uh, the best results because sometimes a live broadcast from a site is not always the most accurate. Um, it often can be very misleading because you've not had a chance to absorb the story, to check a lot of things, to understand its perspective and its relevance before you're speaking about it on the air. And uh, at the end of your broadcasting career, uh, you segue fairly uh, quickly, I guess, into a whole other career at yes. a, uh, a company that people will recognize in Jacksonville, Sally. Sally Corporation, yes. I, I was at Channel 12 for 22 years and um, had achieved the things that I wanted to achieve and um, I had started a new role with, uh, with the owners of the company and that was in uh, strategic planning for all the broadcast operations but to do that job properly I should move to the corporate headquarters in San Antonio, Texas. I'm a Jacksonville boy and very proud of it and tend to stay that way. And uh, didn't want to go to Texas. Didn't want to go to Texas. And I served on the board of a little company here called Sally Corporation or Sally Industries. And its chairman, uh, Prime Osborne, for whom the, our uh, uh, convention center is named after, and who was also the chairman of the board of the CSX Railroad at the time, um, approached me about um, coming over to Sally and taking a crack at doing some turnaround management. It was, had fall, fallen on some tough times in terms of uh, of business and uh, where it was going. And For those who don't know, uh, uh, what's what, what Sally? 
Sally Corporation designs and manufactures animated robots, the kind that uh, sing and dance, as we say, the, the, the animated bears, the Hall of Presidents kind of uh, animated robots. That you might see at amusement parks. You'd see it, you'd see it, you'd see it, all of the amusement parks, Six Flags, Universal, yeah. Disney. And um, it was a, um, a fascinating creative business. And though it was manufacturing, there were elements of it that were not unlike being in a television station. You had the, the artistic and the engineers, uh, you had the sales, you had all of those components. Uh, you just weren't transmitting them, you were building them in the, in the back. And uh, so I sort of took a header and said, yeah, I'm going to try this and see if I can turn it around. I really didn't intend to be there all that long, but I was there 22 years before I retired. So. And you did a lot of travel. Did a great deal of travel. Our business expanded internationally because we found that the growth in theme parks and attractions was really abroad. Yeah, even though uh, Europe and Asia have been in the amusement park business a lot longer than we have here in the United States, which some people find surprising, but it's true. Um, we saw this resurgent in, uh, resurgence in, uh, in Europe particularly and in Asia and uh, we moved a lot of our sales opportunities abroad and so I was spending some years 70 to 100,000 miles, 70,000 to 100,000 miles of my life over there uh, where we really did well <coughs> and expanded our business not very nicely. And uh, a, a, comp a little company in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville uh, founded here by a local dentist, John Rob Holland, um, and uh, the the board were local businessmen. The shareholders are local business people. Um, been here over 35 years, or close to 35 years. Um, located right downtown, we took advantage of the renaissance of downtown when um, La the Villa. in La Villa. It's fine to have opinion, and, and certain uh, cable networks have their own political bet, but that should be identified if it's not easily figured out, but particularly when you are broadcasting uh, an event, uh, and it is an event that has two sides, r let the two sides speak for themselves, and all you need to do is glue them together as best you can. Uh, and I think that, that is a great concern because we're beginning to see uh, through the internet, um, the impact of uh, personal journalists, uh, the bloggers and what have you, speaking with what appears to be such great uh, credibility and authority that it can become very misleading as to where the truth lies. You've, we've got to find some method of judging what is fair, reporting it fairly. So that fairness issue is a very important one to me. You know, look at some of the changes that have taken place in broadcasting the result. Um, Again, when I was in television, it was forbidden by, uh, by the National Association of Broadcasters to allow anything to run across the bottom of the screen mm -hmm. that was not informational. Uh, you could never, ever use the word newsflash unless you had one of two events happen. Either the United States has gone to war or we have uh, have an assassinated or a dead president. That was the only term that you could, only time you could use the term newsflash. You could not use the word bulletin unless you were reporting. But now, bulletin, bulletin, mm -hmm. we've got the best car sale of the weekend. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things that have changed over time that have, that have really taken away a lot of the credibility of what uh, the media really represents. Um, those, those things disturb me. And we've, uh, we've, of course, a long time ago got rid of the fairness doctrine. Um, the purpose of that, of uh, so-called equal time, has gone away a long, long time ago. That uh, required broadcasters to be even-handed in their coverage. So e even if we may, from time to time, have been uh, critical of the FCC for not being as much of a regulator as it should have been, mm -hmm. uh, most of that's gone. The, the there's even less of it today. Right? Far less of it today, and it's an ethical issue, and it's uh, one that's not being policed or spoken about a great deal. Mm -hmm. But we've got an exciting time ahead uh, with all the technologies that are coming. Some very bright young people coming into the industry. That was an interview with Howard Kelly, one of Jacksonville's pioneer broadcasters. Uh, that's our show for tonight. For more information about Jacksonville history, call the Historical Society at 665-0064 or visit our website, jackshistory.com. Thanks for watching. Until next time, we're history.